Today is Pentecost Sunday, as I talked about, and uh, I just want to interrupt our series a little bit, our, our series on the mind that we've been doing, although I am bringing it back to it a little bit later on uh, as well. And we're just going to look a little bit at this story of Pentecost and what happened on that day, and one specific thing that I think changed on that day for those that were followers of Jesus at the time, and I think God wants us to happen and experience as well. So what actually happened? Uh, we wanted to ask a little bit what and a little bit of why, and then look at that one specific thing. So let's just read from the, the whole story in Acts chapter 1 to start with, and then Acts chapter 2, if you've got your Bibles, you can open them up at that. So Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 5. So this is the story. Jesus has died, resurrected. He's told them he's going to leave, uh, and he's just meeting with them a few times. And so Acts chapter 1, verse 4 to 5, and this is where it picks it up from here. And it says this, once when he was eating, so this is Jesus, he was eating with all his disciples, and he, he, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus tells them they're going to be baptized. Now, what does baptized mean? Baptized means, the word actually means completely immersed. It means dipped. It means a few different things, but it's a complete covering. So when they did baptisms in the River Jordan, it would be a complete covering over. And, and, and that's what we do here. If anyone's been baptized here and you didn't quite get a full covering, we'll have put you down again to make sure you did. Uh, and that's what it means. That word baptized means a complete covering all over. And that's a full covering of the outside. So Jesus says they're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, which is a full covering all over the outside. Let's turn then to chapter 2 uh, on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and the four verses that everyone will be reading in church this morning, or a lot of people anyway. And it says this, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, so this is after Jesus has gone into heaven. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like little flames or tongues of fire appeared, sorry not little flames, like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. So we see here in verse 4, the words used here is that they were filled. So Jesus said they're going to be baptized, which is a whole external thing of happening. But then Jesus, uh, the, the, here we read that, that Luke writes that actually they were filled. And, and that's an internal thing. So what's the, what are they trying to put it all together as I just sort of introduce this whole thing? Jesus is saying and the Holy Spirit comes and it does a whole job. It covers the complete outside of us and fills the complete inside of us. So there's no area untouched if we would let him come and do that. And that's what happened on this day. There was something that happened on the inside that filled them right over, but it changed completely everything that was like them on the outside as well. And that's what the experience of being filled or being baptized in the Holy Spirit is all about. It's all-consuming and it's life changing. And we're going to look specifically at one way that I believe it can change our lives, and I believe it changed the lives of the disciples back then, 2,000 years ago. And that is how it affected their speech. Now, you might think that's a bit of a strange thing. We see all the amazing things that happen, and you're going to look at how the Holy Spirit changes our speech. But I think it's really, really important. If you look at these verses, there's a definite theme. In verse 3, there's tongues of fire that come down from heaven. Now, that just might be representative. It might not mean anything too much. But then it says they spoke in different languages. They spoke in different tongues, some translation would put it. And then in verse 14, I'll just read that, we see this. Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. So suddenly Peter, who was quiet and a little bit hiding away with everybody else at this time, a bit frightened, suddenly there was something that happened in his voice that changed because the Holy Spirit, his speech had changed. And we're just going to look at that today. We're going to look at two things. How did the Holy Spirit and how does the Holy Spirit affect how we speak to other people? And also, how does the Holy Spirit affect how we speak to God 
and ourselves. I'm going to get my sister out now. She's just got to come. A little story that's happened in these last few weeks. Uh, and I think part of this is really important. It's about what can happen to the Holy Spirit if we let him. If we open up our ears to hear what he wants to say, but then we also have to open up our mouths and do something about it. So Deb's just going to come and share this story. You can give her a warm welcome if you like. I'm not used to being up here and talking from here, so you'll have to excuse me if it's not brilliant. <laughs> right, about 18 years ago, we had um, a group of young men come to this building uh, from Teen Challenge, which is um, an organize, a Christian organisation who helps people with addictions, and they lead them to Jesus, and, and he is the one who sets them free. And it really um, stayed with me. Uh, and it moved me very much. And one of the young men stayed with us that night, and um, we got to know him quite well. Um, many years later, I can't remember how many, probably another six or seven years, another group came again, and he still came with them, because by that time he was a member of staff working with them, and he stayed with us again. Anyway, through all this 18 years, um, I kept in contact with him, and um, last, uh, you know, he was going on with the Lord, it was fine, everything was fine, and he'd been set free from drugs for 20 years. Last summer, I suddenly started to think about him, and this sometimes happens to me, if I get somebody come to my mind, I used to try and contact them or whatever, make, you know, go and see them if I can, and I could say pretty well, 100% usually, there's a reason why it happens. Well, this started happening last summer, and he was on my mind, so I, he lives in Wales, so I couldn't really just go and see him, so I started praying for him, and I messaged him. And I found out he was in quite a mess again, and his marriage had broken up. He was living alone and in quite a state. So I prayed and he said you know, different things he told me. Anyway, eventually he went into another detox centre, and that was in December, and he came out um, in March, and I know the day because it was my wedding anniversary, so I remember it. Anyway, he came out, he's lost everything, he has nothing, basically what he stands up in is what he's got, so just beware, if you're thinking of getting involved in drugs, don't, it will destroy you, it will kill you. Please don't get into, you know, and if you have a problem today with drugs, please come to the front and somebody will pray with you. And alcohol too, it will grab you. You can't get free from it on your own. Please come and get prayer that the Lord will set you free. Yeah. Um, he came out of the detox centre in March and he had basically not many places to go. But his dad said, you know, he lived in Scotland. He said, you can come and stay with me. I think it was three and a half weeks and he got him a, a train ticket. He, his dad paid for him. And he sought the Lord. He got on back, tra on, back on tra with, track with the Lord. Whilst he was there, I had a, a verse come into my mind and it was totally out of the blue. And the verse was, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I sent it him, and within one minute, he sent me back pictures of writing that he'd done that day on that verse. He'd written ten pages on that verse. He said, I want to show you. I want to encourage you. Look, you sent me the, the, the exact verse that I've, I've been looking into. So it did, you know, it made me feel good as well because I thought, well, I got that right. <laughs> and um, anyway, another verse also came in my mind, and it was, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. So before you, you know, you've got a problem, the Lord sees it, and you just, uh, he, he, he can deal with it way above what you can ever ask or think. This three and a half weeks came to, was coming to an end and he knew he'd got to get on that train. All he got was a friend in Wales that said, you can just stay for four nights with me. And he stayed for four nights, but he knew after that four nights he had nowhere to go. He was homeless. I was praying and I was thinking, oh Lord, you're going to have to show up in this. You know, he's got nowhere to go. What are you going to do? I started 
I thought this shows how how strong my faith was. I started looking on the internet for places for him to stay. And um, anyway, I just I just held off. Anyway, I, I, I went down another route. We thought of somebody we might be able to ask, who might be able to help. And that was a dead end. So I thought, well, my brother's a minister. He must meet people. He must know somebody from Wales, surely. So I, I got on the phone and said, right, do you know anybody in Wales? Because, you know, Reese is in problems and he needs help. He's got nowhere to live. So he said, I can give you a phone. He says, what area? So I told him the area. Gave me the phone number of a pastor uh, in Blackwood, actually, and uh, Pontland Fry. And um, anyway, he gave me this number on the Wednesday. I thought, I'm not ringing today. I've got a lot of things happening. And I, I thought, if, if this pastor starts talking to me, I ain't got time to talk to him, really. So I, I left it till the Thursday. And this is only, was it three weeks ago? Two and a half, three weeks ago. I got on the phone to this man I'd never known, never seen. I had to explain who I was. I said, did you know Johnny? He says, yeah, I know Johnny. Oh, well, I'm his older, very older sister. <laughs> and um, he says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Said, and uh, anyway, I um, started telling him the story. And he, he stopped me. He said, I can't believe you've rung right at this moment in time. He said, in my building, my church building, right now, I have a couple who only come once a week for two hours a week and they work with addicts and they'd have worked with Teen Challenge in the past and this is they're right here now I'm going to go and speak to them now so he put the phone I'll ring you back he went and speak to them he came back he said Matt was the name of the guy he said he remembers Reese from 20 years back for them to be in that place at that time and for God to use me, I don't think I'm much, but he used me yeah. to, you know, to set this up. So a meeting was set up um, for Reese to meet with this guy. And it, it was on the day that he would be homeless that night. He met up with them. And then, <laughs> it's amazing, because there's a, a, another church a little bit away in another area... And they had got this project called Challenge Valleys where they work constantly with addicts. And somebody in the church there had a house that they rent out for people on this project. So that night, he went to this house. So he had a roof over his head. He had food and help with Matt and his wife and the Challenge Valley team. Um, I cannot tell you how excited I was to think that God had intervened in such a great way. And the amazing thing was, when Reese wrote all these things down, he wrote, he wrote what he really wanted God to do for him. And one of the things was, his mum was in one part of Wales here, and he's got one son who was down here. And God placed him right in the middle in this house. And it's just amazing. And he, I, obviously I've asked permission if I can say all this from Reese, And he put this, he said, testify away to his love, mercy, greatness and faithfulness. And I want to tell you, if you're in an impossible situation, God knows he can do so much more than we could ever ask or think. And when I looked on the paper that was actually right, I wrote this down because it was so intricate. At the bottom of this paper was this, I have it all planned Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for, Jeremiah 29, 11. And, you know, I was just so excited. So, Reese, I know you're going to be watching this later. Go on, boy, as they say in Wales. Come on, you can do it. You've got the Lord with you. He's for you. He will never leave you. And the same goes for anybody here. You know, just turn your eyes to the Lord. Whatever situation you find yourself in, he knows and he cares. Thank you. Yeah, our God is, is our God is in control, and, and you might think, well, what's that got to do with your message? The reality is that it's it's very similar to a, a message that uh, something that happened just a few chapters after what we've read about. It's it's the ability to be able to hear and be able to speak. That's what one of the things that really changed with the disciples on the day of Pentecost. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 8, because that's as I heard the story and I knew a little bit of it, and trust me, my part in it was just knowing somebody. 
do you know what I mean? But, but it was great because I met that person a few days later and he was quite amazed by it all still. And all it takes is someone to hear and to speak. And in Acts chapter 8, we have exactly the same thing. We have Philip who was there on the day of Pentecost in that room with all the other disciples. And Philip was there. Uh, and then a few chapters later, we found this. He's doing this incredible work in Samaria, doing amazing things. As an example of what was happening, it says this in verse 6 and verse 7. It said, crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs that he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims, and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So in the middle of this incredible move of God, incredible stuff happening in Philip's life and the ministry that he was taking on, God does something quite strange. And in verse 26, we get this little story that actually probably changed a nation if not a continent because Philip was listening to what God said and in verse 26 it says this as for Philip an angel of the Lord said to him go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza so he started out and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia a eunuch of great authority under the candidate the queen of Ethiopia the eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship and he was now returning seated in his carriage he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah the Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk alongside beside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, do you understand what you were reading? The man replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture that he was reading was this. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop and they went down into the water and Philip baptized him. You see, we have this incredible story right in the middle of a move of God, right in the middle of where Philip wanted to be. God whispers something in his ear, and then he speaks. And just what like Deb's story was there, God sort of whispered something in his ear, and she spoke. It might be a, a text message nowadays or whatever it is, but he heard and he spoke. So in, in, in Philip's situation, there was an angel that comes and speaks to him quite clearly. If you see an angel, it's quite clear. But then in verse 29, we see the Holy Spirit spoke to him and Philip listened and was fully obedient then the Ethiopian spoke to him he said is this I can't get hold of this so Philip listened and he jumped in to the carriage and then Philip spoke his words explained the truths that the Ethiopian needed to hear and that's so important that the Holy Spirit had changed Philip even from that moment, from listening to be able to speak something that he wouldn't have done, I don't believe, until that day of Pentecost. He needed to know it. And it's so important that we are in that same position, that we're in a position that we hear what the Holy Spirit whispers to us. But this is really important. We need to know the truth. You see, Philip knew the truth to be able to explain to that guy. He needed to explain the thing. And we need to know the truth, the truth of God's word. That's why we do in the Bible course. That's why we encourage you every week to read your Bible. Because what we want to do is you need to know the truth. Because then the Holy Spirit works through you knowing the truth to be able to speak to other people. And it's so important that we get that into us. And it gives us, then the Holy Spirit can give us boldness to speak. You see, the same Holy Spirit that took these fearful disciples that were in a room hiding away and it made Peter bold enough to shout out loud in front of the thousands and three thousands gave their life to Jesus that time. The same Spirit that made Philip being able to hear and be able to speak out the words to the one in the chariot wants to do it in you and through you too. Just as is the story we've heard today. He wants to make those stories not like this strange thing that we hear now and again. But our everyday lives, that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in us. In Acts 1.8, Jesus said, his words were when he says, wait for the Holy Spirit and power is going to come because you are going to be my witnesses. And a witness is someone that speaks out the truth of what they know. So being filled with the Spirit changes how we speak to other people. Are you still with me? Fantastic. Okay, this is my second point. Only two points today. We're doing well. We're well on it. So it changes how we speak to people, but being filled with the Holy Spirit also changes how we speak to ourselves and with God. Now, I've put ourselves because I'm constantly talking to myself. 
um, as anyone in the building or in my house would anticipate, people think I'm talking, but I'm talking to myself. I'm kind of talking to God as well, but it sounds like I'm talking to myself. Uh, and, and we, the, no matter what your theology is, one of the things that's really important is the first sign that the Holy Spirit came was people speaking in different languages. Now, whether our theology is on tongues in different languages doesn't really matter. We can't deny this truth right now. That was the first initial sign at this stage of that. And this experience changed them from being frightened folk to fighting folk. I made that up myself. I was quite pleased with it. But it changed the disciples from being frightened folk to fighting folk overnight. And I just want to share a little bit of my own experience right now, the importance of what this is in my life. How speaking in tongues actually has an incredible help to me. And this is where I'm linking it to the mind. Because in the battle for my mind, probably this is, I find, God's greatest tool to me personally in my battle for the mind. The gift of speaking in tongues or different languages. Sorry if this is going to freak you out, but I'm going to tell you exactly how it is because it's true. You see, next week we're going to look a little bit, you remember a couple of weeks ago we looked at strongholds, and we've not forgotten that, we're going to come back to that next week, and we're going to talk about what the key is from 2 Corinthians 10, when Paul talks about taking down strongholds. We're going to look at what that looks like, and we're going to look a little bit at taking every thought captive and what that means. So we'll come back to that. But I just want to share this as my own personal, absolute incredible thing that I use regularly uh, as something. See, one in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul talks a little bit about speaking in tongues because it's an issue going on in the church and the people aren't sure quite how it should be used. And in 1 Corinthians 14, he talks about this. So I'm going to skip the first verse and I'm going to go to verses 2 to 4 and we're going to just talk about this because Paul talks about what it means. In 1 Corinthians 14, 2 to 4, he says this. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you'll be talking only to God since people won't be able to understand you. You'll be speaking by the power of the Spirit but it will, be, it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. So Paul is talking here to a church that is that, that, that some of the gifts are being used in ways that perhaps aren't very helpful to the church. So Paul's just sort of putting some clarity in as to what that might look like. And he's saying, he says these words, and sometimes we look at the things that he says speaking in tongues isn't, but we miss what it is. He says speaking in tongues builds us up and it strengthens us. And that's an incredible gift, but I don't know about you, but I need that in my life every single day. I need building up and I need strengthening. Sometimes we just say, God, give me strength, and that's great. But actually there's a tool that God gives, a gift that God gives, I believe, for the church and anyone that would use it to build us up and to strengthen us. And when I'm wrestling my mind, when I'm battling my mind, and if if you think I don't battle things in my mind, then let me tell you I do. I bat doubts and fears the same as everybody else. I get them and, and I have to wrestle with them. But very often this gift, this gift of speaking in tongues is a key to me breaking through in this area so often in my life. I was just talking to someone else. I'm sure Trevor won't mind. Most of you all know Trevor. And we were just talking the other day and he said exactly the same thing. So he was in church a few weeks ago and there was just a situation came up and he just didn't really know what to do with it, just a different sort of situation. He said, and he felt a bit of a challenge in his mind, but he said he got in his car, spoke in tongues for five minutes and something broke and changed. And I just want to tell you, there's something in it that matters and we mustn't run away from this gift that God has given to his church of speaking in tongues because in my life, it's absolutely life-changing in the area, in the battle of my mind. And I want to encourage us to do that as well. Time's nearly gone, so I'm going to just skip a little bit. I'm going to skip those next verses. But Paul spoke in tongues more than everybody else, he said. You see, baptism or filling in the Spirit releases this incredible gift of speaking in tongues. And you might be here thinking today, I thought I've never even heard of it, I don't know anything about it. But I just want to encourage those of you here today, it's a real gift for us, for his church right now. And it strengthens and it builds you up. And I know that I love it because one of the things I really love about this gift is I don't know how it works, but it works. And that's what I love about God because God is, I think that's why this is such a great gift and why we sort of, people shy away from it. Lots of people are frightened of it because they've got to suddenly let go of some of their things because they can't work it out. 
And if you've got a mind that has to work everything out, then you'll struggle with this gift of God, the gift of the Holy Spirit of speaking in tongues, because it actually, you, you'll think, oh, well, I can't quite grasp this. I can get this, and I can get this. But I, it's so important that if you're a Christian, I believe God wants to fill you with his Spirit and give you this gift. You've got to stop trying to figure it out, and you've got to let the Holy Spirit completely cover you. Like we said, the baptism is the outside and the inside all together, and that is what happens. You see, what happened on Pentecost 2,000 years ago, I believe is absolutely for you today. Christian in this place today, that's not just something that happened 2,000 years ago. Perhaps the band could come up. That would be great. Um, I've been having discussions with one or two people that would, you would call cessationalists that say, actually, the Holy Spirit isn't sort of... It, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit sort of stopped years ago, and it's not for the church today. Um, and I thought it might sort of challenge my faith, but I'll tell you all it did. It inspired me to realize that we need it more and more. It, it, it inspired me to realize that it's relevant for me today, and it's relevant for you today. God didn't give the Holy Spirit just for that church at that time. The more I look at it, and the more I listen to other arguments, when I look at the world around today, if, if the church needed the gift back then, boy, do we need the church gifts more than ever today in our church, in this church, in your life, in every single day life. To live as a Christian, we need every single bit of help that we can get in this world today. And we need to see the gifts moving more and more. You see, one of the definite effects of the Holy Spirit coming on that day of Pentecost was that their speech was changed. Yeah, they began to speak in different languages, but their speech was spent as they, as they should suddenly have power to speak to other people. Uh, and just as we've heard this story of someone listening and then speaking words to put things in place, God wants to do that in our lives today. God wants us to be the same sort of people that live lives like Philip, that move and do incredible things. That the, 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 the day of miracles, the day of incredible encounters, the day of all those coincidences that Deb talked about, they're not coincidences. God put everything in place, just waiting for one person to listen, to speak and put things in place for them. And he wants to do that in your life, in every moment of your life, through his Holy Spirit, he wants to do that in you today. God wants you to be a witness. That's what the Holy Spirit is for, to be a witness. That's a witness of speaking out the things that he has done. And he wants you to be able to speak. He wants you to change the way you speak to God and speak to yourselves. And one of those gifts is the Holy Spirit. One of those gifts is speaking in different languages, in different tongues. And I just felt challenged while I was praying over this word that We'll pray for some people in the next few days. We're going to have that encounter night and we're going to make specific space in that. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, you've never spoken in tongues and you want to do that, we're going to make specific space and we're going to make space for it in a minute as well. But there's, there's, there's more of a journey sometimes for some people. My own journey was I think I was filled with the Holy Spirit for years, but I managed to convince myself what I was saying wasn't from God and I just sat on it for years. And then in my room... God just released it in me and I just began to speak in tongues and both felt something incredible happen. And that could be your experience or it could be that today, right in this place, just as we worship, God releases your tongue. But this is the specific thing that I felt God challenged me on, that there's people in here that have spoken in tongues years ago when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's just been sat dormant in your life. You've probably told yourself maybe that's not of God. But God wants to release that in you today. He wants to release it in you again today. This is Pentecost Sunday. We're celebrating all that God did, but not we're celebrating that not, that wasn't the end of the book. The book of Acts just keeps on being written because everything that God did, he's still doing in churches and in places around the world today, even stories that we've heard in this place today. So right now, I just want us to stand to our feet if we can. Close our eyes. And we're just going to sing and worship for five or, five or ten minutes maybe at the most. Unless the sound of a mighty wind comes. But maybe in this place today, you've been longing. And if you haven't, maybe you've got a longing starting to you. Of some of these things of God. Things you've maybe heard about, read about. But actually you've thought, well, is that for me? I'm, I'm just a Christian. I just want to get through life. I don't want... I want to tell you that the, the Pentecostal fire that fell on that day is still alive, still as real for you today, wherever you are, and still as relevant as what you need. 
So we're just going to worship. We're going to sing, Holy Spirit, you're welcome. And we're going to worship him. And I just encourage you, as we worship, just begin to call out. Just begin to worship, begin to let your tongue go, begin to speak the words that God gives you. And just maybe in this place today, a hunger will stir. And that's the first part. And these next three days, maybe of prayer and fasting, you'll hunger, you'll press in and say, God, more of a desire of that. I'd encourage you while we worship, and if you speak in tongues, speak in tongues as we sing it. Sing in tongues today, whatever it is that's in you, and it might just begin something in someone around you. If you've never experienced, I pray for a hunger with you. And yet, yeah, and if you want prayer for that, then just come to the front while we worship as well. Not making a big deal of it, but if you want it, we'll come and we'll pray for you, and some of our guys will pray for you as well. So let's just worship right now. Thank you, Phil.